Welcome. Today we are going through lesson 1 1, which is all about the properties of real numbers. So we are jumping right in here to talking about some core foundational pieces of Algebra 2. So we're going to start by talking about real numbers, and later in the class we'll get into imaginary numbers. The real numbers are the sets of numbers that can be written as decimals. So we have a few types here. We're going to start with rational numbers. In rational numbers, we use the letter Q to represent. A rational number is a number that can be written as A or B, and its decimal version is terminating or repeating. So the decimal ends at some point, like 1.25, or the decimal repeats, like 1.333 ongoing. So there are three types of rational numbers that you'll want to know about. The first rational number that we want to know about are natural numbers, which we use the letter N for. Those are the numbers that you learned to count when you first learned to count. So one, two, three, so on and so forth. Those are your natural numbers. Then we have whole numbers, which includes zero and all those natural numbers. And then the last one we have under the rational numbers is integers, which we use the letter Z for. So integers are the natural numbers, the whole numbers, and the negatives of them. So integers include positive and negative, whole numbers include zero and above, and natural numbers are just your counting numbers starting at one. All right, next up, we have what are called irrational numbers. So these are, or these contain any number that can be written as a decimal, but whose decimal part does not repeat or terminate. So think about like pi, for example, numbers that go on forever in their decimal form and never repeat. So those are the two types of numbers we're going to look at here. So we're going to kind of use this diagram to show the relationship. So our most inward, most exclusive group, if you will, is the natural numbers. So some examples of that would be like 175 or 2 or the square root of 9. Those would all be natural numbers. All right, so then going one step out from there, the next thing to include is the 0. And that would be the whole numbers. So the whole numbers is the next step out. Then we have the integer numbers next. So that's your z's. So remember that includes the negatives of all those counting numbers and zero. And then our furthest out group is all the rational numbers together. So this would include decimals that end. It would include fractions, so things that can be written as A over B, maybe like 3 eighths, something like that, or a repeating decimal, so maybe 1.45 repeating over and over and over again. So those are the numbers and where they would be placed in this particular group. So those numbers that we just talked about are the real numbers. So all of those numbers over there are real. And then numbers that are not real are, um, or sorry, not, not numbers that are not real, numbers that are not rational are called irrational. So all the irrational numbers would be over here. And if we look at those, that would include pi, and it would include anything that wouldn't end. So the square root of five would be the other one that would be irrational. Okay, so. That is kind of our general overview. We're going to use those real numbers now to look at some properties of real numbers. So let's figure out this table here. So for these properties, we're going to look at some examples and kind of what they look like um, as general statements, and then we'll look at the main idea. So the first one is called the identity property. And the identity property is the idea that I can add or multiply by a number, but the number doesn't change. So if we think about that in terms of adding, the number that I would add to any number and not make it change is zero. So when we're adding, the identity property is that I can add zero to any number and it won't change values. In terms of multiplication, when I multiply by something and not have it change, it would be multiplying by 
one. So the general statement of that would be that any number, I'm going to call it A, times one no, still stays as A. So again, the main idea is that we add or multiply by a number, but the number does not change. The next property is the inverse property. So the inverse property is where we're adding or multiplying the inverse of that number. So in this case, we can see that when we're adding, we just add the number with the opposite sign to cancel them out or to get them to reduced in addition to zero. So I would add a plus its opposite, and that's always gonna give me zero. When we're multiplying, the inverse property reduces to one. So as long as a is not zero, because if a was zero, it's gonna multiply towards zero, then we can take any number times one over that number, and it's always gonna reduce to one. So that's where we use our opposites, whether that's positive and negative when you're adding, or a number and it's um, reciprocal when you're multiplying, and that cancels the values out reduces them to something else. All right, the next property we have is the commutative property. So the commutative property essentially says the main idea is that the order of the values doesn't matter. So we can add or multiply in any order and it doesn't change the outcome. All right, so let's look at that in terms of addition. So in addition, we can add in any order, seven plus eight or eight plus seven. In general, we would write that as A plus B is the same as B plus A. You can multiply or add in any order and still get the same value. Same thing in multiplication. So coming up with an example, you can pick any two numbers. Let's do five times two. That's the same as two times five. So I always remember it, we can commute, we can move um, in either direction and it still equals the same value. All right, and then our next property is the associative property. And the associative property is similar to the commutative property, except it's based on grouping. So in the commutative property, the grouping of the values, so generally using parentheses, doesn't matter. Won't change the outcome, if you will. So whether I group the first two numbers, the last two numbers together, it doesn't matter, the outcome's still the same. So in the associative property, an example, if we just go with the most basic, if I take one plus two and then add three, that's the same as taking one and adding the quantity of two plus three. So I can add the one plus two first or the two plus three first and my outcome stays the same. In multiplication, the same thing is true. So if I take two numbers and multiply them and then multiply by a third number, that's the same as multiplying the last two first and then multiplying by the first one. So the order in which we group things together doesn't affect the outcomes. All right, our next property is called the distributive property. So in this one, the general idea is how to multiply a value to an expression that's inside. So notice this one is all multiplication. So when we're multiplying, it says that we can take a value outside the parentheses and multiply it by the first number inside the parentheses, and then take that same value and multiply it by the second number in the parentheses and get the same outcome. So the general statement for any numbers would look like something times two numbers being added. We can split apart into the value times the first number plus the value times the second number. So we can use the distributive property to distribute that value outside and get our multiplication still. All right, our final property here is called the closure property. So we're gonna read this together here. It says for all real numbers, 
a plus b, a minus b, a times b, and a divided by b. Any two real numbers under these operations will produce a real number. So the closure property says that if I take two real numbers, add them, subtract them, multiply them, or divide them, I'm going to get a real number as an answer. However, not all the subsets, right? So our um, natural numbers, our whole numbers, our integers, all that stuff of the real numbers are closed under all operations. So going a little bit further, it says a set is closed under an operation if the operation always produces an element of the same set. So to be fully closed, I would have to be able to add or subtract whatever operation we're talking about and get an element of the same set. So whole numbers produce whole numbers or integers produce integers. That's what closure means. All right, so those are the properties of real numbers. And in the beginning, we talked about um, how to identify real numbers and what they look like. And that is all for today. We'll see you next time.